Welcome to this video where we will be looking at the signs, symptoms, investigations, diagnosis and management of asthma. If you haven't already done so, be sure to check out our other video on the pathophysiology of asthma. Let's start by looking at the signs and symptoms that typically present in patients experiencing an acute asthma attack. Because asthma causes reversible airflow obstruction, patients are asymptomatic between attacks and generally their lung function tests are normal. During the initial attack, patients may experience mild symptoms such as a cough as the bronchioles become irritated by histamine and leukotrienes, initiating the cough reflex. They may also have an increased respiratory rate as the amount of air exchanged reduces due to airflow obstruction. The respiratory system will then increase the respiratory rate to improve minute volume. They may be unable to speak in full sentences as the demand for air increases. You may see a use of accessory muscles as the patient tries to recruit more muscles to help with the expulsion of air, which is normally a passive process. On auscultation, you may hear a polymorphic wheeze, especially on exhalation, but as the attack becomes more severe, it may result in an expiratory and inspiratory wheeze. This is due to air travelling at high speeds through narrow airways, similar to a whistling action. Patients may also have reduced air entry on auscultation due to the reduction in ventilation throughout the lungs. Because asthma is an obstructive lung disease, it means that these patients have a difficulty in getting air out of the lungs, as opposed to a restrictive lung disease, which causes difficulty in getting air into the lungs. Because of this, patients may have an extended expiratory phase, and that's because it's taking longer for air to be exhaled. This extended expiratory phase can manifest on a capnogram, typically described as a shark fin pattern, which represents the difficulty in exhalation and the presence of bronchospasm. Patients may also have a reduced peak flow, and a peak flow measurement measures the fastest point of a person's expiratory flow, and you may see it referred to as peak expiratory flow rate, or PEFR. This is a tool used to identify the level of airway obstruction that is present. The use of a peak flow reading helps aid in assessing the severity of an asthma attack, as well as measuring how effective your treatment is. However, patients experiencing a severe attack may not be willing to use the peak flow. More severe signs and symptoms that show a patient may be tiring and no longer compensating include a silent chest, where no sounds can be heard on auscultation, cyanosis, which is a blue discoloration which can be seen centrally, such as the lips or tongue, or peripherally, such as the fingers. This is caused by a lack of oxygen bound to red blood cells. Patients may have reduced oxygen saturations as ventilation starts to fail. They may have confusion and agitation as they become hypoxemic. And in severe cases, this can lead to unconsciousness and cardiac arrest. The severity of an acute asthma attack can be graded based on the patient's signs and symptoms and will help in guiding management. Acute asthma attacks can be categorised as moderate, severe and life-threatening. Patients experiencing a moderate asthma attack will have a peak flow reading between 50 and 75% of their predicted best or 50 to 75% of what is normal for them with associated signs and symptoms such as shortness of breath and a wheeze on auscultation. Patients with severe asthma will have a peak flow between 33% and 50% of their predicted best, a respiratory rate greater than 25 breaths per minute and a heart rate greater than 110 beats per minute with associated signs and symptoms. 
Life-threatening asthma will present with a peak flow of less than 33% of predicted best, although you may struggle to get a life-threatening asthma patient to perform the test. They will have saturations less than 92% on air, they may be tiring and they may have a silent chest. Now let's look at how asthma is diagnosed. For asthma to be investigated, there first must be clinical suspicion that the patient may be suffering with the condition. Typically, a patient with undiagnosed asthma will present with a history suggestive of the condition. This includes asthma symptoms which come in episodes. This is because asthma is a reversible obstructive lung disease which tends to be particularly worse at night. This is because natural epinephrine and cortisol levels are of their lowest of an evening. Epinephrine has a direct effect on relaxing bronchial smooth muscle and cortisol suppresses the inflammatory response which we will discuss more in the treatment. Patients who have asthma typically have a history of other atopic conditions such as eczema and normally there's a family history. To diagnose asthma, a pulmonary function test is conducted and this consists of two measurements. The first is the volume of air a patient can exhale as fast as possible in one second and is a measurement of how easily air can flow out of the lungs. It is denoted as FEV1 and stands for forced expiratory volume in one second. The second is the forced vital capacity and is a measurement of the total amount of air a patient can take into their lungs and is calculated by measuring how much air is exhaled after full inhalation. An obstructive lung disease is diagnosed when the FEV1, so the forced expiratory volume in one second, is less than 75% of the forced vital capacity. This demonstrates a patient has a condition which affects the passage of air during exhalation. We then need to test whether the obstruction is reversible or chronic. This is done by giving the patient a short-acting bronchodilator and repeating the test. If the forced expiratory volume in one second improves by 12% or more, then the diagnosis is asthma. This is because we have managed to reverse the obstructive pathology. If it does not improve, however, or it is less than 12%, then it's a chronic condition and the diagnosis would be COPD. Now, as we previously mentioned, Asthma is asymptomatic when the patient is not experiencing an acute attack and therefore their pulmonary function tests may be normal. So a reaction may need to be provoked with a methylcholine challenge. The pulmonary function test is performed and then methylcholine is administered. Methylcholine is a cholinergic agonist which will act on the muscarinic receptors within the bronchioles causing constriction. If a patient has asthma, then their airways are going to narrow significantly as they are hyper-responsive. The pulmonary function test is then repeated and if there is a drop in the forced expiratory volume in one second of 20% or greater, then this is indicative of asthma. It is important to make yourself familiar with local guidelines on investigations and diagnosis. Now let's look at the acute treatment and long-term management of asthma. Long-term management of patients who suffer with asthma will depend on the frequency and severity of their symptoms. Long-term management will aim to prevent acute attacks as well as relieve mild symptoms when they present. Some medications that can be utilised include short-acting beta-2 agonists, which can be prescribed to patients who suffer in frequent episodes of mild wheezing, which can be used when required to relieve attacks, and is commonly referred to as the reliever medication. 
Short-acting beta-2 agonists work by stimulating beta-2 receptors within bronchial smooth muscle, causing bronchodilation and relaxation. It is important patients are shown how to use their inhaler effectively, and a spacer may be used if it improves patient compliance. Low-dose corticosteroid inhalers can be prescribed for patients who suffer more frequent episodes and is used to prevent attacks from developing, commonly known as the preventer medication. A common side effect of steroid inhalers is oral thrush, so it is important to remind patients that they need to rinse their mouth out after use. Leukotriene receptor antagonists can be used, such as Montelukast, which will inhibit leukotrienes from binding to their receptors and exerting their inflammatory effect. Long-acting beta-2 agonists may be used if the patient has a good response to them. The mechanism of action is similar to that of a short-acting beta-2 agonist, but it exerts its effect for much longer. Long-acting muscarinic antagonists, such as tiotropium, will block parasympathetic bronchoconstriction by binding to muscarinic 3 receptors in bronchial smooth muscle and inhibiting acetylcholine from exerting an effect. Maintenance and reliever therapy is a combined inhaler of corticosteroids and a long-acting beta-2 agonist, which can be used as a reliever and a preventer. These medications should be used in a stepwise approach, as directed by local guidance. It is important to start therapy based on the severity of symptoms a patient experiences, making adjustments as required. The goal of long-term management should be to eliminate symptoms and exacerbations with the least amount of medication. Now let's look at medications utilised in an acute asthmatic attack. Treatment should always be initiated promptly to relieve symptoms and restore normal physiology. In patients suffering with mild to moderate asthma, you can try and encourage the use of the patient's own inhaler, as this is the least aggressive treatment and will teach the patient the correct use of their rescue medication. This encourages the use of their own inhaler and that they won't always require medical assistance if they can manage their own symptoms. We can then utilise a beta-2 agonist. This will be an oxygen-driven nebulizer consisting of a short-acting bronchodilator, such as salbutamol, which can be repeated if necessary. Iprotropium bromide is an antimuscarinic and will inhibit parasympathetic tone on bronchial smooth muscle, causing relaxation. Ipotropium will also help to dry up some of the excess mucus that has been produced. Glucocorticoids, such as oral prednisolone or intravenous hydrocortisone, can be given to provide an anti-inflammatory effect in severe and life-threatening asthma attacks. The management of severe or life-threatening asthma may require further treatment, which includes adrenaline, which is given as an intramuscular injection and will exert an effect on beta-2 receptors in bronchial smooth muscle, causing dilation of the airways. A phosphodiesterase inhibiting drug can be used to cause muscle relaxation by enhancing the presence of nitric oxide. Intravenous salbutamol can be given, which has more bioavailability. However, the side effects can be worse from intravenous salbutamol, and serum potassium will need to be monitored as salbutamol can cause hypokalemia. Magnesium sulfate can induce bronchial smooth muscle relaxation by inhibiting calcium influx into cells and reducing the cross bridge formation in bronchial smooth muscle. And in severe cases, patients may require sedation and intubation. Patients suffering life-threatening asthma will typically need to be admitted to a high dependency unit or intensive care unit. It is important that, throughout treatment, patients are continuously monitored for their response to treatment and whether they are deteriorating. To measure response, the patient's respiratory rate can be observed, respiratory effort, peak flow, oxygen saturations, and chest sounds. 
Patients are typically given a course of steroids following an attack to prevent the secondary attack mediated by leukocytes, as discussed in the pathophysiology video. To recap, asthma is defined as a chronic inflammatory respiratory condition that causes reversible episodes of variable airflow obstruction due to constriction and narrowing of the airways. Asthma is diagnosed based on clinical presentation and pulmonary function tests. Signs and symptoms include difficulty in breathing, an increased respiratory rate, an increased heart rate, an expiratory wheeze, a cough, and a reduced peak flow. Treatment for long-term management includes preventatives and relievers, which should be used in a stepwise approach to meet the specific needs of the patient. Asthma attacks can be life-threatening, so it is important to assess the severity and treat appropriately. It is important to monitor the effect of your treatment and formulate an appropriate care pathway. Thank you for watching, and I hope you found this video helpful. Be sure to check out our other videos, and if there are any topics you would like us to cover, then please leave a comment in the comment section below.